Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, we'd like to take this opportunity to welcome Casey Worrell uh, on to do a presentation for us this afternoon over ultrasound. Uh, it's going to be fairly broad, but Casey's certainly willing to go into as much detail uh, as we would like. And he's asked that if you have any questions along the way, go ahead and, and send those in through the question and answer. Uh, and he'd like to try to address those as we are going through the, the presentation. Uh, Casey comes to us uh, with a, a lot of history within the, the ultrasound world, is one of the texts that's most widely used across the US, and I think Casey's probably even scanned some cattle internationally. Uh, so uh, I, I don't know exactly how many thousand a year you scan, Casey, but I know it's a lot, and I know you cover lots of country. So without that, I'll turn it over to, to you, and we'll get going. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity today to talk about carcass traits and I thank you Colin and Lance for um, all you've done not only for the breed but also to just try to stress the importance of carcass traits. Um, I truly believe in the breed and I know I've seen differences throughout the years. I've ultrasounded a lot of beef master cattle. Um, Colin made a comment about how many I do a year and it's about 18,000 a year. So I see a lot of different breeds and a lot of different breeders and uh, it's really neat to see the improvement the Beefmaster breed has made through the years. Um, I'm able to see it and uh, the progress is definitely there. So to get started in our, our conversation here, and I call it a conversation because I really want this to be informal. If you've got questions, that's probably the best part about these presentations is being able to answer questions. So if there's something I don't cover or something that I did cover, but um, you might have a further question, please ask it and then I'll try to keep up with this as we go and um, answer the questions kind of throughout the thing versus at the very end. Um, so to get this started is why are even carcass traits important? And um, you know, if any of you have ever heard me give a talk before, one of the things I, I always stress is we're all in the beef business. Now as a registered breeder, you might think, well, I'm not selling beef, I'm selling seed stock cattle that are way too valuable to be slaughtered. But basically, if it wasn't for beef consumption, all these animals that we have out here in the pasture would be pets because ultimately that's what we're here for. Um, so regardless of what segment of the beef industry you're in, you're in the beef business. There's been a transition throughout the last, I'd say 10 years, maybe 15 to 20 years from being a commodity driven business to a consumer driven industry. And the reason I say that in the past is beef was just a commodity that was sold strictly by price, um, price per pound. And now the consumers is, is making more of a statement as to what they're wanting and what they're willing to pay for. And that's driving the industry into what the pricing of this beef is. Um, cons the consumer is demanding a higher quality, leaner beef. And that's, that's no doubt. Um, it's probably always been what they've demanded, but until more recently, that's what they're more willing to pay for. And so due to that, we're seeing an increased emphasis on improving the quality and the consistency of beef. Um, the packers are establishing the price based on the individual um, carcass merit of that animal. So if we think about the past, if I had a pen of steers in a feedlot, let's say I had 70 steers in a feedlot, there would be a buyer that come in there and they would price it um, per pound based on what they feel that they could price fairly and still make money at. Um, now what they're doing is the majority of the cattle that are getting slaughtered and sold at Packers is after that animal is slaughtered, they're looking at the car carcass quality and the yield grade and paying based off of that price. So it's more of an individual pricing system than it is like a group price that is went in the past. Give just a brief history on carcass ultrasound. The original research started back in the 1950s, but due to the technology or the, the um, poor technology, it wasn't very accurate at that time. Um, it wasn't until about the 80s, 1980s, when it started getting more accurate. And I guess I saw it back in the early 90s that the breed associations had confidence in it and started accepting the information for their database. Um, and so although the technology has been around for close to 70 years, the, it wasn't accurate enough until the breed associations uh, started accepting into their database till probably the late 90s. And each breed would be in a little bit different timeline on that. But um, it definitely has been around for a while. 
And you can imagine with the technology we have today and the amount of research that has been done, how much accuracy we have in this ultrasound data. So let's get into some important things to consider when collecting carcass ultrasound data. And probably one of the first things you got to start with for the Beef Master Association is it must have either a certificate number or a performance only or a P number, we might call it. Um, so when I come to ultrasound, I don't have to have that number the day I ultrasound, but for me to submit that to the Beef Master Association, we must have that number. And that's so important because I've got cattle that I scanned a year or two maybe three years ago that I never received a certificate number. And so that number has never been utilized by the Beefmaster Association. If you go to the cost and expense and time and effort to collect ultrasound, it's so important that you submit it to the Beefmaster Association. And the reason that is, is it helps you make better decisions and improve your herd, but it also improves the breed because as the Beefmaster breed builds this giant database of information, we can have a better understanding of the superior genetics or the inferior genetics. And as a breed, we can improve, not just as an individual breeder. So number one, really work on getting your certificate numbers or a P number so that when somebody like myself come in ultrasound, we can get that submitted to the association. The next thing that you need to consider when you're gonna carcass ultrasound is the age of the animal. And for the Beef Master Association, that age window is from 320 to 500 days of age. And you might ask, well, why do they have that age window? Well, based on the research, they have an adjustment for when, when I come to ultra, somebody comes to ultrasound, you'll get the actual measurement, but they also adjust it to what it, they thought it would be at 365 days of age. And so in order to do a fair adjustment, we need to ultrasound those animals within that window. Another thing that's kind of interesting that I'd like to point out too, especially on bulls, is testosterone has a negative effect on marbling. So if you say, well, I've got this four-year-old bull that I'd like to ultrasound, even though he's out of the age window, I'd still like to see how much marbling or ribeye he has. And due to his testosterone and his activity breeding cows, he probably won't have much marbling, which doesn't necessarily tell us his genetics. It just tells us that at that point, that's what he has. So it's really important that we do these cattle within that age window. The next thing I want to stress, and I probably can't stress this enough that I see way too often is the nutrition level of the animals that we would be scanning. Um, these animals must have the opportunity to express their full genetic potential. It's no different, I've got two young boys and if they didn't have good nutrition or if we didn't feed them properly, they won't develop into the, the adult that they probably could have. And so it's no different with these cattle. If they don't get the nutrition level, we won't see the true genetic potential that they have. So you might ask, well, what's a guideline? Because you know, I, it's hard for me to gauge if my cattle are getting too fat or they're not getting enough feed. Um, what can I use to, as a guideline? And I would say from my years of experience, and, and I'm not saying this to brag, but I was one of the first ultrasound technicians to get certified in the United States. In fact, I went to Canada the first time for a certification because there wasn't one in the United States. And I've been doing it for about over 20 years now. And from my years of experience, you'd like to see heifers gaining around at least one and a half pounds a day from weaning to yearling, when we'd be ultrasound these cattle at around a, a year of age. And again, that's just kind of a guideline. Now that's not to say if you've got the heifers gaining two and a half or one pound, that's gonna be a disaster, but I'd like to see at least one and a half pounds of gain, average daily gain from weaning to yearling. There are some ranches I go to and they say, well, since weaning, these cattle haven't gained anything. They're kind of the same weight as they were at weaning time. And that tells me one thing, they didn't have the nutrition to, to grow, to um, progress and to show their genetic potential. Um, and so let's say a one and a half pound gain is what we'd like to see at least on heifers. So from weaning at let's say 205 days to ultrasound at 365 days, that's like 160 days time window. Well, if they're gaining a one and a half pounds a day, 
we'd like to gain at least 240 pounds from weaning to yearling. Again, don't hold me to that exact number, but that works as a really good guideline. So you might ask, well, what on bulls would you like to see? And I'd say for bulls, I'd like to see at least two pounds of average daily gain from weaning to yearling. Again, I think the more gain, the more they're gonna stress or express those genetics, but that might be like a minimum. So that would be gaining around 320 days from weaning to when we'd ultrasound them. I just recently did a bull test and those cattle were gaining like 3.3 pounds a day. Man, that's ideal. If they can uh, gain that much, then we're gonna truly see their genetic potential. So another way to look at it, and I like to see at least two tenths of back fat on an animal. If I see an ultrasound in an animal and it's got maybe a tenth or 1500 back fat, that's telling me it probably is not getting enough energy in their, their ration to truly um, express its genetic potential. So those are just kind of guidelines. And I like to look at that for, especially for new breeders that have never done this before that, that really don't know where do I start on condition wise. Um, so to talk a little bit about condition and nutrition, let's say that those cattle didn't really gain much from weaning to yearling. You just turned them out on grass and the grass might have not been very good or, or there were some other issues going on that they didn't gain much. How would that affect the ultrasound data? The still see differences, let's say there's 40 bulls out in the pasture and they didn't really get taken care of nutrition wise, they didn't gain much, but we ultrasounded them anyways we're still gonna see some differences on ribeye size, on marbling, on back fat, on rump fat, but the range won't be as good. So let's say they don't have the proper nutrition and the ribeyes range from a 10 square inch to 11 and a half square inch. Whereas if those cattle were on a good nutrition plane, that range might be from a 10 square inch to a 13 and a half or 14 square inch ribeye. So what we're gonna see is a bigger variation because those better cattle are really gonna prosper and show how much better they are than their others. Um, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of idea on nutrition. I can't stress it enough. Uh, if we're no different than taking a, a yearling weight, a weaning weight, if, if the cattle don't have the proper nutrition, then their weights are gonna suffer. Uh, and so nutrition is so important. And I have a lot of customers that say, well, I sell my bulls to commercial men that run their cattle in a commercial environment. And so I wanna run my bulls in the same environment so that those customers of mine can see how those cattle perform in that environment. The problem I have is that they're, you're not selling commercial calves, you're selling seed stock. And these cattle should be far superior to what they're um, raising just off of their commercial cows. Um, and so I think that's so important. Another thing, is if I'm selling a bull that has a weaning weight of let's say 500 pounds and my customer buying this bull, his average weaning weights are 625 pounds, he's gonna question what kind of quality bull is he buying there. So I, I have a problem sometimes with register breeders telling me, well, I'm gonna run my cattle like commercial cattle because I think that's told two, diff, two totally different scenarios. Um, so hopefully that's enough said on nutrition. I feel it's so important. The next thing we'll talk about is facilities. Hey Casey, yes, there sir. is one question that, that came up there real quick. Okay. Okay, so I don't think, I don't know if everybody else can see this question. So I'm gonna read this out. Is there a correlation between rib and rump fat with regard to conditioning? If so, what target ranges and what ranges are considered excessive? That's a great question. And I'm, that's why I'm glad um, we're gonna discuss that while we're talking about this subject. So the correlation between rib fat and rump fat are high, extremely high. And the reason why is there's these fat cells that are getting deposited. The research is showing that the fat that's getting deposited sub, subcutaneously, which means between the skin and the muscle, is different than the fat cells that are getting deposited within the muscle, which is marbling. And I'm getting a little bit off subject here, but I think this is very important. So that being said is we can have an individual animal that's really high in marbling with very little back fat, but we could also have an animal with a lot of back fat with no marbling because the genetics that control one trait 
aren't the same that control the other trait. So the question here is, what's the correlation between rib fat and rump fat? And those are both subcutaneous fats. So that's fat under the skin, but on top of that muscle, if that makes sense. So that correlation is gonna be extremely high because the same genetics that control the subcutaneous fat on rib will also be the same genetics in the rump fat. Now, a lot of times you'll see when you ultrasound, your rump fat measurement is about half, or, or not half, is twice as much as your back fat measurement. You might ask, why is that? And I remember when Tommy Perkins um, and I had this discussion years ago, and he said, well, if you look at sheep that do really good in the desert environments, they'll produce more fat over the rump, um, which they use for energy storage. And also I've been told that cattle sometimes will put fat from the back to the front. Um, so the reasons why, and we might not know exactly why, but there will usually be more rump fat than there is rib fat. Uh, a lot of times I'll see that'll be an equal number. But the one thing to know is those are highly correlated. So if I see very little rump, rib fat or back fat, I'll see very little rump fat. And if I see a whole lot of back fat, I see a whole lot of rump fat. So the variation um, is those, those are highly correlated. What's the target range? You know, that, that question is one I get asked a lot too. When they say back fat, how much back fat do we really need? And, um, and I'll get into that topic a little bit later when we start interpreting the ultrasound data where they say this animal has two tenths of back fat and this animal has four tenths. What is that? Where's the, the proper range? I think in order to ultrasound, we'd like to see at least two tenths that shows that they're getting the proper um, nutrition. But what I don't want to see is the average of my group at two tenths, and then I've got one or two individuals at a half inch of back fat. That's telling me that they have the genetics to put on way too much back fat. And if I'm going to feed those cattle in a, a commercial or in a feedlot environment, those are going to be terrible yield grades because they're going to have too much fat. So when we talk about the target ranges, I'd say maybe around two to three tenths, maybe 3,500s would be kind of the ideal. Uh, I know, realize too on these heifers that you will have to get those bred and make cows out of them. And so if we push these cattle so hard that they have five tenths of an inch back fat, they're also going to be harder to get bred, which is detrimental to your program as well. So um, that fat target range, maybe I'd say would be two tenths to 3,500s. I think that would be showing the optimal uh, genetics, but also not being detrimental to getting them bred or bulls that are getting too fat as well. Excessive uh, back fat was it, the, or excessive fat at the end, I'd say it would be over four to five tenths. Uh, most fat cattle in the feed yard would be killed at around a half inch of back fat, but those are also not used for reproduction. And I think as we get cattle too fat, we start seeing uh, a decrease in, in their fertility or their ability to get to reproduce. Did that answer the question okay? Colin? Yes, I believe so. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thanks for the question. Um, okay, so we talked about nutrition. Let's talk about facilities. And this is probably the simplest part. I need electricity or, or your technician will need electricity. Um, these ultrasound machines, and I've had people say, well, I've got an inverter in my truck. Can we use that? Uh, you basically have an ultrasound machine. You're going to have a, a computer to capture those images and really if you get a good technician they need to have a set of clippers and a cattle blower. The reason why is we need to get that animal as clean as we possibly can so that I can or the, trans, the technician can lay that transducer right up on the animal's skin. So in the winter time when they're real hairy you need to clip that animal um, and also have a blower to blow the dirt out so that you can get the best possible contact you can with that animal. So electricity is important. The next thing is a squeeze chute. And you know, you might think, well, that's a given. Every time we work our cattle, we use a squeeze shoe. But not, I've seen it so many times and more when I first got started with some smaller breeders is they'll have a, either a cattle trim chute or they'll just have a head gate or they just kind of mash them up between a gate or somehow to try to restrain the animal. You really need a trim, sh a squeeze shoe. I'm sorry, a squeeze shoe is so important. And, uh, and, and why is we don't want to just catch their head, but we want to keep the animal from moving. Because when they move, 
around, it's blurring that ultrasound image, which is going to affect their marbling score. Also, when, when I, I've noticed too, when I don't have the animal squeeze properly, a lot of times they pull back in the chute, which causes them to kind of waller out their back or kind of sway their back, and they're distorting the shape of that ribeye. And some of this sounds maybe a little more technical, but when you squeeze an animal, not only are you keeping them from moving, but you're keeping that top line really nice and flat and level so that that ribeye is not distorted. When you pull and muscle apart, you're gonna stretch it out. So when they're in a shoot and trying to pull brace backwards, it's gonna affect it to some extent. So there again, it's so important that the technician realizes, hey, let's unsqueeze this animal, let's get him to stand back up again. Uh, I even recently saw, there was a little bit of research done where by not squeezing the cattle, it affected the marbling score because of the way the animal was holding their top. And so I can't stress it enough, get you a squeeze chute that you can squeeze the animal down and, and limit the amount of movement. And if you have an animal go down the chute or is really fighting, um, make sure the technician takes his time to get that animal standing right, to get it the best possible measurement they can. Okay, the next thing we need is a scale. The reason why we need a scale is we need to have a scan weight. And for the association, that, that weight needs to be taken within seven days of when you ultrasound, meaning seven days before or up to seven days after. Now, 98% of the ranches I go to, we take a scan weight the day that I scan. And it's just it's so much easier because they, a lot of times the scale is under the chute. Um, we can take it right then and there. But I realize there's times where maybe your scale's not working, your scale's at a different location, and you've got to take a weight other than when you're actually doing the ultrasound. And if that's the case, you have seven days to do that. Uh, so that's given a scan weight. And uh, that scan weight is also able to use for a yearling weight. So earlier I talked about the age range being from 320 to 550 or 500 days. That's also the same age range for a yearling weight. So the nice thing is with the Beef Master Association, when you're ultrasounding, the weight you take for ultrasound can also be turned in for your yearling weight. It's Again, it's a good time to take your scrotal measurements on your bulls. Um, if you're taking a hip height, a yearling hip height, it's a good time to do that as well. In fact, I try to encourage my breeders, do all that while I'm there ultrasounding versus having me ultrasound and then running them through the chute and doing it again. So if you've got a technician, um, really try to get all that measured at once. I think it just makes it simpler for, the, for you, the breeder, but it also makes it easier on the cattle. Another thing that's really important to consider before you're collecting ultrasound data is a ultrasound barn sheet. And that comes from the Beef Master Association. What that barn sheet gives the technician is the age of the animal, the certificate number, the tattoo, um, all the information that the technician needs to submit to back to the Beef Master Association. So basically the process that we go through is you contact the technician, the technician will come out and ultrasound and they'll save those images. They'll submit those to an independent lab for interpretation. Once that data is interpreted, it'll go back to the Beef Master Association into their database. And then the Beef Master Association will generate a report for you. And we'll get into their report here shortly. So through all those steps, if the technician has the barn sheets, they'll have either the P number or the C number needed so that when we submit that to the, back to the association, it'll go right into their database. So ultrasound barn sheets are so important. Let's say that your technician shows up and you forgot to print out your barn sheets and he's going to scan them anyways. What happens? Well, even if you could send it to them at a later time or if you could just get them a certificate number, with the website nowadays, if somebody gives me a certificate number, I can go on to the website and look up all the information I need and I'll actually generate a barn sheet if I don't have one given to me. But if I have that certificate number, it's the unique number that only that individual has and we can gather the rest of the information. So the ultrasound barn sheet. So the last thing that you need to consider when you're ultrasounding is a technician. And the technicians need to be certified through the UGC, which is the Ultrasound Guidelines Council. 
it oversees our industry. We have to be tested on actual live animals that will get slaughtered and they see how accurate we are to the actual kill data. We also, also have to take a written test so that we know about the industry and about the technology. And um, it's so important because if, if I was just to go out or any guy would just go out and get an ultrasound machine, the integrity of the data could be jeopardized plus the association's database. And that's really the, val the greatest value I see as association is they're upholding the integrity of this database that's so important so that us as breeders can make the most accurate and useful decisions off of this data. And so, um, so you do need to find a technician and there's places I think you could go to on maybe the BBU website um, and look up ultrasound. You could probably click on and find a list of technicians. If not, you could go to ultrasoundbeef.org, which is the UGC website and they have a list of all the technicians in the United States. Okay, so that's all the things to consider when collecting carcass ultrasound data. And if there's any other questions on that, um, I kind of expected some more nutrition questions because, man, I feel like that's so important. But um, if there are, you can send them to me now or later, either way. Okay, so let's say a person like myself comes out and ultrasounds your cattle and you get the results back. And uh, I've got just a copy of some results that the Beefmaster Association sends back. And I know it can be very confusing. It's a lot of information. And on this report, it's got their birth information, their weaning information, their yearling information, and their ultrasound information. And it can be very overwhelming. And so hopefully, I don't know if any of you have a report like this handy, but hopefully we can go down and kind of break this up a little bit and make more sense of it. So let's get back to ultrasound. The traits that I measure is ribeye area, back fat, rump fat, and marbling, those four traits. And you might say, well, why ribeye area? The ribeye is measured between the 12th and 13th rib, and that's the exact same place the USDA inspector in a packing plant would look at that ribeye between the 12th and 13th rib. So we're measuring these animals the exact same place that if that was an actual carcass hanging there, we would look at ribeye and back fat. So it's so important. As a technician, if I was to move up and was to take an ultrasound image between the 11th and 12th rib of the ribeye, as a lab interpreting those images, they would see that I was in the wrong location because the, the uh, muscles, the way the muscles lay in there, there's different muscles that come in as you move farther up on the animal. And so if I'm ahead of that 12th, 13th or behind it, they would be able to tell and they would reject those images. And so again, we're measuring the ribeye, we're the exact same place in the back fat, the USDA inspector. Um, and so when you get your data back, you'll get the raw information. And so let's say for instance, a ribeye is a 12 square inch. That's a, the area of that ribeye muscle. That's what it was, the raw data, the day we ultrasounded them. Then you'll get an adjusted. So on your, your report, you'll see the actual raw data, or which I call raw data, the actual ribeye area. And then you'll see the adjusted underneath that. Well, adjusted is what the, the they should have been at 365 days of age. And so if I've got 30 bulls and I'm ultrasounding them and they're different ages, it's really hard to compare the bulls on the actual because some of them have an age advantage where they're older or younger. Um, and so by just in 365, I can look at those 20 bulls on an equal playing field. Now you might say, is that adjustment right every time? And the answer would be no. It'd be impossible to know. If we ultrasound a bull at 400 days old, exactly what it was at 365, but based on all the research done, especially within the beef master breed, we have a very accurate adjustment. And so that adjusted would allow you to look on an equal playing field, um, what we'd expect. So let's say we have a 400 day old bull ultrasounded. He's in his ribeye was a 13 square inch. He's going to get adjusted down to what we thought he was at 365 for just for instance, let's say he adjusted a 12 and a half square inch from a 13 to a 12 and a half. Now, if we ultrasound another animal that is at 320 days of age and it had a 12 inch ribeye, well, his will be adjusted up to let's say a 12.8. A 
because we would expect, you know, another 80 days or whatever that his ribeye grew larger. So the adjusted, if you're going to look at the data, I would look at the adjusted before I looked at the raw data on an equal playing field for comparison's sake. Now, a lot of times I'll look in a sale catalog and I'll see a bull listed and he'll say he had a 15 square inch ribeye. That's his individual and that's good, but it really doesn't always put it in perspective because I don't know what the average of his group was. If that bull had a 15 square inch ribeye, you might think, well, that's really big. But if I knew the average of his, of his herd was a 16.2 square inch ribeye, then that 15 doesn't look so well. If I knew the average within his herd was a 12 square inch ribeye and this bull advertises a 15, that tells me his genetics are really superior. So I guess the point I'm getting at is the next thing we're gonna discuss, and that is contemporary grouping. And I cannot stress enough, I used to work for a breed association. I used to work for a breed association and probably the number one thing I felt I could do to help educate the breeders within that breed was talking about contemporary groups. So I know Lance has talked about this a lot. I know you've probably heard a lot of talks about contemporary groups, but I'd like to really get into this subject closer and talk about it, how it relates to carcass as well. Ultimately, what we're looking at is EPDs or expected progeny differences. We're looking at the genetic potential of these animals. We're measuring for their genetics and we wanna know what kind of genetics to expect out of them. EPDs are probably the greatest invention ever in the beef industry, in my opinion. When I think about my great grandfather, a hundred years ago, went out and bought a bull. He didn't have EPDs. He had to go look at that bull and what that bull looked like, but that didn't always transmit into those calves. With the EPDs today, we're able to look at the sheer genetics, something that we can't see, which is underneath the hide, and find those cattle that are superior that I can't see what kind of calves that he's gonna produce, but I can see the EPDs he has. So what EPDs do is that it takes away the effect of environment and nutrition and just looks at the genetic potential of that animal. Well, you might think, well, how can we do that? If we're taking a weight of, or let's correlate this to ultrasound, we're taking a ribeye measurement of a 15 square inch. How can we take away the effects of the nutrition, how much it got fed, in the environment, how great the environment was. Meaning, was he up in Montana in the wintertime in 20 degrees or 20 below zero? Or was he down in Texas in the wintertime where it was maybe in the 60s? Um, how, was he, what kind of nutrition he was on? Well, how can we take away those effects of environment and nutrition and look at EPDs in Montana the same way we'd use EPDs in Texas? And the way we do that is with contemporary groups. The definition of a temporary group is cattle that have been treated the same. So it's the same sex, they've had the same management and the same nutrition. So let's say I have a group of, of heifers that I ultrasound. They were born, all born on my place. They're within a, a, a short window, let's say 120 days or 90 days of age. They're all heifers. They've all had the same feed. They've had the same amount of cold fronts, the same amount of rainfall, the same fly control, the same vaccinations, the same water quality. I guess you get what I'm saying is my group of cattle have been treated the same. So when I ultrasound that group of heifers, any differences I see on their ultrasound is due to genetics within that contemporary group because everything else was equal. So to get back to a contemporary group is that's animal that have all been treated the same They've had, again, the same environment and same nutrition. So any differences I see within that contemporary group is due to genetics. And that's a fairly simple explanation, but that's basically how we formulate EPDs is off of the contemporary groups. So when we ultrasound these animals and it has a 12 inch ribeye and 5% intermuscular fat or marbling, what does that do? to their EPDs, it's all based on how that compares to within their contemporary group. So me personally, if I'm looking at a bull, I could care less probably if it had a 12 square inch ribeye or a 16 square inch ribeye, is I wanna know how did it ratio within its contemporary group? Because 
again, I talked about, you know, a 15 square inch ribeye might sound really big, but if I knew their average was a 16, genetic wise, that animal's not very good. And so I have customers that say, well, I can't get the EPDs my neighbor has because he's creep feeding them. He's got improved pastures. He's doing all these things that I'm not, and he's getting these better weights. Well, as a breed association, they could care less what your neighbor's cattle weigh. They want to know how your cattle weighed within their contemporary group. So you're only comparing your cattle to your cattle that have been treated the exact same throughout their life. Now, that being said, it happens all the time. I show up to somebody's place to ultrasound, and they say, well, I've got three show heifers that my kids have. I want to ultrasound. And we'll ultrasound those three. Well, if I was to put those three within the contemporary group of his other cows that have just been out in the pasture, or other heifers, that's going to really distort their contemporary group. It'll make the show cattle look good because they're on a high, high plane of nutrition. And it'll make his pasture cattle look inferior when genetic wise, they might not be. So that being said, when your technician comes to ultrasound, make sure that your contemporary groups are done properly. The cattle that are getting compared are getting done within cattle to a group that have been treated the exact same. I might even go so far as if I have a set of bulls, one set of bulls are on a different ranch, they've got better nutrition, maybe better grass, or um, for whatever reason, they're gonna be heavier. And then another pasture where I'm weaning or bringing in cattle with lighter yearling weights, I would treat those as two different contemporary groups because they're, they, they're not, it's not fair on their nutrition and their management. Um, if I have a show calf, that needs to be a different contemporary group. If you have a sick calf, that needs to be done on a different contemporary group. For instance, a bull comes in there and he's, you can see his ribs, his ears are drooping. You can tell he's been sick. The breeder says, oh, I still want to ultrasound him for the data, but he's had respiratory issues. He's lost weight. When I submit that, if I was submitted within the others, it would reflect poorly on him because probably he's not going to ultrasound very good because of the situation he was in, which is going to affect his EPDs. Um, and so if he was put out in a separate contemporary group, then it'll show that, yes, he was ultrasounded. We have the information, but we're not going to compare him to the others because it's not done fairly. So hopefully, I can't stress enough contemporary groups, and hopefully I've shed some light to it on it. I know Lance has talked to it about it a lot, but um, I've got a, a report here from a breeder on their ultrasound data. And this is something I'd just like to go through right quick. So at birth, on this group of calves, there was 11 head in their contemporary group at birth. So there was 11 head when those set of calves were born that report, reported the same. At weaning time, there was nine calves in that group. So two calves either got sold, got sick, got um, something happened and they were taken out of that contemporary group. So we went from 11 head down to nine head. When I look at the yearling report with the ultrasound data, there's eight head in there. So maybe he sold another one, it got cold, um, for whatever reason, it didn't get pinned that morning when we ultrasounded, for whatever reason that there's eight head in that contemporary group. So it started out as 11 at birth, went to nine, down to eight. So on contemporary grouping, whatever group they were born in, you can never add to it. Like you can't have 11 at birth and then have 20 in that contemporary group at Yearling. It's only gonna start out with the group that they were reported at birth weight. So cattle can only be taken out of a contemporary group. You can never add to it. So let's say you go and you buy a really nice bull and you say, I want to ultrasound this bull with my bulls. He's not going to be in the same contemporary group because he wasn't raised with that. So he'd probably be in a group by himself. So when you're looking at this report and you say, well, why is there 11 at birth and nine at weaning and only eight at yearling? And you reported that, that's how those groups were reported in. So, um, Again, contemporary groups important. So what does the contemporary grouping do? Well, it gives us ratios. And again, it's the ratios that change the EPDs. It's not the actual number. As an association, 
they probably could care less whether it was a 2% marbling or a 5% marbling. It's what did it ratio? So within that contemporary group, the average of that group will ratio 100. An animal that ratios 120 is 20% above the average of the group. A bull that ratios 80 would be 20% below the average of the group. So with all the different operations and all over the United States, all the different feed programs in different environment and different conditions, whether it's down in South Louisiana where you've got um, flies and mosquitoes and humidity versus Nebraska where you might not have none of that. Um, the ratios are what's so important. It's, it's cattle that have been treated in the exact same environment and how they did amongst their contemporaries. So if an animal ratios really well, that might move that EPD up. If they ratio real poorly, it might move that EP down. So looking at this data, when I look at this sheet here and I look at all the information, probably the thing that I draw my eye to the first is how did they ratio? Um, here's an individual just for instance, for weight, he ratioed 82. So he was 18% below the average of the group. His ribeye ratioed 74. So there again, he was below average. His marbling, he averaged, ratioed 56. So that's well below the average of the group. But then there's another one here that a marbling ratioed 121 with the ribeye ratio of 127 and a weight ratio of 107. So that bull just shot the other one out of the water because he was 21% above average for marbling, 27 above for ribeye, 7% above for weight. So when I see those ratios of those numbers, that puts it all in perspective. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if you're looking at this sheet, you're going to see the actual data, adjusted data, and how they ratio. And again, going back to an earlier explanation, if I'm looking at a bull cell catalog or I'm looking at the, a magazine and I'm seeing an ad for a bull cell coming up and it said the bull had a 16.2 inch ribeye, what does that really tell you? Well, that's probably big if I think about my program, but now if it tells me he ratioed a 132, man, that puts it in perspective that when he was with cattle that were treated the same, he was 32% above anything else in that entire group. So I probably would rather see a ratio on an animal than I would the actual measurement. Um, another thing I wanna talk about, I know I'm talking a lot on contemporary groups, but the integrity of the data relies on it. The bigger the contemporary group, the better the comparison of the cattle and the better the, the ratios will be. If I'm gonna say I'm really a fast runner and I go race three men today, let's say 100 yards and I win, you might say, well, that's pretty fast. But that was just against three people. If I get in a race in a marathon and let's say there's 280 people in that marathon and I win, you say that, that guy's really fast or he's a really good runner or has a lot of endurance because that was a big group he tested in. Now I understand a lot of small breeders might have five head and they said, all I have is five head. It's so important if you have that five head, you make sure that five head's a contemporary group and not a contemporary group of two, another contemporary group of two, and then a contemporary group of one. Now, I hope that makes sense. The larger you can make your contemporary groups fairly, the better the comparison is. Not everybody has the luxury of having a hundred head contemporary group, but man, if you do, you can, that, that one individual that out ratios a hundred head, that says a lot. Um, the problem I see is somebody that could have a hundred head contemporary group at what, for whatever reason at weaning time, he weaned off 15 head today. Then next week he does 25 head. And then the week after that, he did 10 more. What he's doing is he's just breaking that nice hundred head group into 15 head, 20 head, 18 head. So his comparison's not gonna be near as good. Um, that being said, those 100 head might've stayed together their whole life, but the way he reported it 
was he just did so many every, at night when he had time or he said, well, I'm going to turn in these 20 and go to bed. Well, that, that broke that group up. So again, let's try to keep these contemporary groups as big as possible, but do it fairly so that these ratios mean more. Hey so, Casey. Yes, sir. Would you address just a little bit on if the, when you're talking about contemporary groups, when you show up, if you're breaking those contemporary groups or inputting that information for the groups for management codes on for the questions you might ask, or if that's something that these guys need to do for you. Sure. And Colin, I, I hope I'm not getting more into the EPDs and contemporary group talk, but um, I feel that's so important on the ultrasound. And that's a great question. A lot of times I've been going to these ranches for 10 years or 15 years. I've had some customers from the very get go and uh, they'll say, you know, they'll just, I know that these cattle have all been treated the same and that they'll have on the barn sheet, they'll denote the ones that are in a different contemporary group. I never know 100% what that program is doing contemporary group wise. So I have to have that from the breeder. It needs to be either on that sheet or they need to say, hey, um, these are three show heifers. When, when I go ahead and submit it, I would know that those three would be in a different contemporary group. But don't rely on your technician to know what you're doing on your program. Let's say as a technician, you didn't tell them they're going to probably just report it all in the same contemporary group, which is however that contemporary group was broken down last at weaning time. So um, really the breeder needs to fill out that information or tell the technician. And that, a lot of times they'll just say, hey, this is a different group of cattle. We're, you know, put those in a different contemporary group. And I try to have that talk a lot with my customers that is this, you know, a different group or we'll set up at a different ranch and I'll know that that's obviously a, a different group of cattle. They've been treated differently. But that's why that uh, ultrasound barn sheet is so important because not only does it have the certificate numbers and birth date and all the information that the association currently has on file, it also has a place for us to put the stuff that the association doesn't have on file, which is contemporary group, scan date, scan weight, um, a nutrition code. And so like on this sheet here that I've got, and I, I apologize, I don't have it where you can see it on the screen, but for many of you that ultrasounded, you've seen one of these reports. There's a code here on Yerlin and it says ADC2. What does that mean, ADC2? The contemporary group was A, D stands for developing heifer, C is a sex, which is a cow or a female. And two is the management code, which means that that animal had less than 50% concentrate in its diet. So they could have zero concentrate, which is a zero code, meaning they're just on sheer forage. They could have, I'd have to look, maybe that's a one, zero percent concentrate I think is a one, which is just sheer forage. A two would be less than 50% concentrate, meaning I've got cattle out on grass and on pasture, but every once in a while I'll either throw them some cubes or they're getting a little feed, but they're getting less than 50% concentrate, meaning like corn or some kind of a concentrated feed. Or the last code would be over 50% concentrate. So that's just a feed code. Again, that would be on that barn sheet. And uh, Colin, did I answer that question that you? Yes, sir, you did, thank okay. you. So again, nobody knows a contemporary group but the breeder. And you can tell them the technician verbally or really it'd be best to just fill out that barn sheet. That's why they're there for. Okay, so I know I've talked a lot about contemporary groups and hopefully if we all do a better job of explaining contemporary groups or, or reporting contemporary groups, then the data is gonna be more accurate and we can all make better breeding decisions. Okay, the next thing I'm gonna talk about in Many of y'all that ever knew Tommy Perkins was once at the Beef Master Association. This was something that he talked a lot about, and that's ribeye area per hundred weight. And, uh, you know, I think it's important. The association doesn't give you that number, but it's really easy to calculate. 
I say they don't give it, I don't believe they do. But it's really easy to calculate because it puts it into perspective. If I tell you I had a heifer with a 12 square inch ribeye, you might think, okay, that's good. But if I told you her body weight was 1300 pounds, that's not even one square inch of ribeye per 100 pounds of body weight. And I know that's an exaggeration. We don't need 1300 pound heif yearling heifers. But if I told you she had a 12 square inch ribeye and her skin weight was 800 pounds, her ribeye area per hundred weight was really good. And so it looks, it takes, kind of puts it into perspective. Um, I personally, when I look at the adjusted ribeye size for 365 days of age, I think it, how quick was that animal ability to grow a ribeye in 365 days? I look at that as a lot of growth. It's how that animal was able to grow in 365 days. If I look at ribeye area per hundred weight, personally, I think it's maybe a good indication of muslin is what proportion of that animal's total body weight is in regards to ribeye size. So I kind of think that's a good way of looking at muslin, whereas, yeah, adjusted ribeye size is going to help you on muslin too, of course, but it's also kind of an, in, it's adjusted to age versus one's adjusted to size of the animal. So that being said, on heifers, I'd like to see 1.1 square inch of ribeye for every 100 pounds of body weight. I mean, that's kind of a minimum for me. And that's not to say if I had a heifer that had one square inch of ribeye per 100 pounds of body weight, I'd color. Because maybe she has some other things that are really good. You know, she has some other traits that are superior. She just, when I would breed that heifer, I'd look at breeding her to a bull that maybe fixed that problem and help her with some ribeye because obviously she's not as thick as I'd like to see. But ideally I'd like to see 1.1 square inches per hundred weight. So a thousand pound heifer, 11 square inch ribeye. Now again, most of you probably don't have a thousand pound yearling heifers, but that's just an easy way of looking at it. So what would it be for bulls? In the past, I used to say 1.2 square inches of ribeye for 100 pounds of body weight, but truly, if I'm going to be honest, I'd like to see a 1.3. Uh, a thousand pound bull, I'd like to see at least a 13 square inch ribeye. And you might say, man, that's, that's pretty big, and that's bigger than what I'm doing. Um, but that's, that's where I think we need to be on our bulls. We need to have some more muscle, in, not just within any one breed, but as an industry. If you look at the average muslin in the commercial cow out there, she's gonna probably need a boost in muslin on those calves. So a, a 13 square inch ribeye in a bull doesn't mean all of his calves are gonna be 13 square inches if you breed them to some commercial cows that are lacking in muslin. So I set the standard pretty high for bulls and uh, that's just my personal numbers. Now, that's not coming from the Beef Master Association, that's not coming from UGC, that's just me personally. I like to see 1.1 on heifers and 1.3 on bulls. Again, I just think it's another way we can compare that ribeye size and put it in perspective. Um, another thing that I feel is useful, when I look at these sheets, and at the end, it's got the averages for the contemporary groups, okay? So this is all on the individual basis. You can, and Lance might not like this because it's probably going to cause a lot of extra work, but knowing Lance, and I've talked to him earlier, he's all about trying to give the best information to you breeders. You can request to get this ultrasound information grouped by sire groups. That being said, if you've got, let's say, four herd bulls out there, and this set of calves ultrasound that are out of those four, four herd bulls, you can run those averages so bull A average ribeye was a 13.2. Bull B's calves average ribeye was a 14.1. Bull C's average ribeye was a 9.8. You can group this data by sire group and really get a good idea of which bulls out there are producing the, the higher carcass cattle or which ones are doing the inferior job. So when I look at this on an individual basis, I would have to go back and look at each one's sire to try to figure it out but Lance can generate you a report by sire group averages. And I feel that's so important, especially if you're using herd bulls or even if you're using AI sires 
or let's say I've got one AI sire and two herd bulls, how are my calves out of, or calves out on my herd bulls comparing against the AI, AI sire? And with this here on an individual basis, it would take a lot to try to pull all those animals out and do an average. The association can generate you that report. So uh, Lance said he's more than willing to do that. And uh, I think that's really valuable information. Um, Casey, so, can you, yes, sir. Can you address a little bit on marbling scores from from ultrasound and how they correlate to carcass quality grades? Sure. So the, the best way to do that would be there's a chart that you can get, and uh, you can look at the marbling scores versus the quality grades. And so, off the top of my head, like a two to a 3.9% marbling would be a low to a high select. So a low select would actually be a, a two to 3%, and then a three to 4% would be high select. And then a four to 5.6% is a low choice. Um, and then you get into the prime at about 8.6%. So I apologize I don't have that chart in front of me, that's going off of memory, but a two to Two to a 3.9 is select USDA quality grade. And then a four to a 8.5 would be a choice. That'd be low choice, average choice, high choice. And then you get above a 8.6, you're in the prime. Now, when you get your ultrasound results back, it's in a percentage. And the reason why is the when I ultrasound that animal's ribeye, you can see that marbling in that ribeye muscle. And a computer will figure out what percentage is marbling versus muscle, and it'll read it out as a percentage score. And so the higher the percentage, the higher the amount of marbling. So, um, you know, I have some customers that say, I want at least a 4% because that gets into the low choice. Or I'm gonna buy this heifer because she was a 4% marbling. Me personally, I don't, you know, if that cattle animal was fed a lot or had some really great advantages, um, I'd want to see her EPD or see at least her ratio more than that she was just 4% marbling. But the percentage will put it in the, uh, the, you can actually take the marbling score and put it into a quality grade. Does that answer your question, Colin? Yes, sir. Okay. So, and that's a good question. Um, man, y'all send me all the, or give me all the questions. I promise there's no dumb questions here. I know there's some things that I'm overlooking. Um, so please ask as many questions as you can. Okay, so I think on summary of this report that you get back, the, inf the interesting information is, is you've got the actuals, you've got the adjusted, and you've got the ratios, and again, the ratios is what I use for comparison personally. Um, contemporary groups are listed on here. They're EPDs. Oh, and that's another thing I'd like to talk about. So ultrasound carcass, or just say carcass EPDs. When an animal is born, it received half its genetics from its sire and half of its genetics from its dam. Okay, so when we start with that animal's or carcass EPDs, let's say for ribeye, it's gonna be the average of the sire's EPD and, and the, the average of the sire and dam's EPD because it got half from one and half from the other. That's just the basic way, that's the best way we can do. So let's say, and I'm don't, these numbers are just for example sake, the sire's EPD was a five, the dam's EPD was a zero, that calf started with a 2.5 because he got half from the sire and half from his dam. Now I know and you know that it's not always the same gene same genes that get passed from the sire and dam. I've got two boys from the same mother and father that are a lot of differences amongst them because the way the genes were passed. But starting out, that's the best we can do is an average of the sire and dam. When you ultrasound that animal, based on how it ratios within that contemporary group, that EPD is going to move because we have more information on that animal's genetics, not just based on what we think it got from its mother and father. 
So its EPDs are gonna move and its accuracies are gonna go up because that EPD is more predictable because there's more information that it's calculated off of. Another important thing is when we ultrasound that individual, it reflects back on its siren dam. And so by ultrasound in calves out of a certain cow or a certain bull, we're getting more information on them. So their EPDs are gonna change based on how their progeny do and their accuracies will go up as well. So if you see an AI sire that maybe has hundreds of calves registered that have been ultrasounded, he's gonna have a lot of predictability in his EPDs and his accuracies are gonna show it because all those cattle were used in different places in different contemporary groups and we have a better idea of what the predictability of his EPDs are. So by ultrasounding your animals, you're not only improving proven your individual, but you're also proving your cow herd and your bull battery as well. If you're using herd bulls and you've got somebody coming out and ultrasounding year after year, before long you get some really good ideal or predictors of what kind of genetics you've got in that bull um, because you've got more information. Again, the truly the value of, in my opinion, the breed associations is to uphold the integrity of the breed but also store all this great data because we can make such better breeding decisions. Um, when I stay up at night in my office and looking at bulls and EPDs and pedigrees and all that, I can make so much better decisions because I have all this information versus going out and looking at that bull and they say, well, he's out of a bull named Primo or whatever the bull is. Primo might've been a great bull, but that's not really helping my bottom line as much as all this data and information. You know, I was on an airplane not long ago and I was reading the magazine that's in the pocket of the seat in front of me. And it was talking about businesses and, and management. And it said the number one reason for business failure today is due to lack of good information. And this was before coronavirus, of course. But I think that's so important that not only if I run my business, my ranching business or my ultrasound business, without good information, I can't make the right breeding decisions or as, as, as accurate breeding decisions. Um, and so when you're ultrasounding your cattle, you're not only improving your herd, but you're helping the breed itself because we're gonna have better idea of those genetics that are superior and inferior. Um, so really the last thing, if I was just to kind of summarize all this, and, and I hope I didn't get too far into genetics and, and not into the ultrasound part of it, but the thing I want to emphasize, number one, is single trait selection. I make my living off of carcass, or my ultrasound business is off of carcass traits. Um, and I feel it's so important today because truly, I mean, I was in a feed yard just a couple of weeks ago in Kansas, and they don't talk about percent choice being fed anymore. They're talking percent prime. The value of those prime carcasses or those high choice are so much more valuable that those producers that are raising those are just so much more profitable. And so our industry is shifting to more of a high quality product. And as much as I believe in that, you cannot single trait select for carcass traits. Um, and I've seen it done through the years. I've seen different breeders and different breeds say, you know, those high marbling females are bringing a lot of money at these sales. I'm going to just go after those high marbling females. And you'll get that because these are some of our most highly traits, highly heritable traits that we measure. Our car carcass traits are some of our most highly heritable. If you put emphasis on marbling, you're going to get better marbling. But if you just focus solely on marbling, you might lose out on cavities, weaning weight, milking ability, fertility, all the other important traits that we have. So yes, carcass is important. It's extremely important, but it's just another piece of the puzzle. Um, I think we have to, number one, if we're looking at the economics, your reproductive traits are gonna be your number one economical trait, fertility. If that cow doesn't have a live calf every year, it doesn't matter what kind of potential that calf would have had for marbling. If it's got a, she's got to breed and she's got to breed back every year and they've got to perform. So today I'm talking a lot about carcass. Basically all I've talked about is carcass, but I don't want anybody to leave here thinking, okay, we just need to focus on carcass. I think in the registered business, 
you can look at these sales and you can look at some of the cattle that are bringing a lot of money. And I think you can look at the ones that are probably going to be pretty good carcass. I think you can definitely look at the trend and see that carcass is getting more important. But don't, please don't just single trait select and say, well, I'm going to buy this bull, even though he's bad footed or he's hawking in or he's got a bad attitude. He's got really good carcass numbers. You really think twice about that because long term, yeah, you're going to improve your carcass, but are you really improving your program? Um, that being said, if there's ever anything I can do, the, the, the thing that right now I have so many customers, I travel about 13 states a year. It gets harder and harder for me to come do 10 or 15 or 20 head just from a time standpoint. Um, earlier I said I scanned 18,000 head, but I did that within about seven months of the year because you're scanning them at a year of age in spring and the fall is when people are calving. Again, I'm not saying that to brag, except that it's hard for me a lot of times to come to a smaller operation. Um, I know like Melvin Shears had the Live Oak group. They do a, a group together where breeders come to one location and we're able to scan maybe 10 or 12 breeders at one time which is really beneficial to me, but it's also hopefully beneficial to the breeders. Again, there's a list of technicians and not everybody's that busy. And so um, please don't get discouraged if you've just got two or three head and I can't come or a technician, try the next guy. I know for a fact, when I started out, I was hoping my phone would ring and I would go travel to do one or two head because that was better than sitting at home doing nothing. Um, and so please don't get discouraged if you're a small breeder. Uh, try to find a technician that, that, um, that is, there's people out there or try to find a, a, a breeder um, in your area. I know Bill Botard called me and said there's some other breeders in the area here that would like to scan and we just did it in one location and it helped. It's hard for me to pass up 120 head to do 15 head in a day. But that being said, Please don't get discouraged and no matter what size you are, make sure you measure your cattle, not only just for carcass, but for all these traits. That being said, I guess I'm finished. Colin, is there anything else? No, that's, that's it, Casey. And we certainly appreciate your time today. Uh, and I guess if, if you guys, if y'all have some questions uh, or something that we didn't cover, we tried to ask a few of the questions that we hear routinely uh, and I know Casey addressed quite a few that that we hear on particular uh, parts about ultrasound how they're applied what they need and everything else but if there's something else that we didn't get to please let us know uh, post those in the question and answer uh, box the forum and we'll take just a couple more minutes here before we close up see if there's any more questions and if you think of something sometime along the way don't hesitate reach out to Lance or myself, let us know. Uh, if it's not something we can answer, then we certainly have resources like Casey out there that are more than glad to, to help us out like he has today. Well, and I'd like to apologize too for being long-winded. I know I talked to Lance this morning. He said a lot of times they're 20 to 30 minutes. And I just looked at my clock and it's like over an hour. So I apologize for that. Um, but I think the values in the information and for any of you that stood into the very end, I hope you were able to get something out of it. All right. Well, uh, right now, Casey, I think you must have done a pretty good job and answered everybody's questions because we don't have any. So. Yeah, that or everybody's at lunch. <laughs> and no, uh, certainly we appreciate your time today. And if something comes in, we'll certainly pass Thanks again it on. for having me on, Colin. No problem. Well, hope everyone has a good rest of the week. And if there's ever anything we can do, let us know. And Casey, we'll look forward to seeing you down the road at one of the other events. Okay. Thanks a lot. Have a good day.